There we go. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Kubernetes 1.20. Welcome to our very first live webinar of 2021. Thanks for kicking it off with us. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters, Jeremy Rickard, software engineer at VMware and Kirsten Garrison, software engineer at Red Hat. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box that I will activate right now. So you should be able to see that next to your chat. Um, leave your questions there. Feel free to pop them in now towards the end, whenever you think, and we will get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Please be respectful of fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF website, as well as back through this registration link at, at community.cncf.io under online programs. With that, I will hand it over to Jeremy and Kirsten to kick it off. Hey, thanks, Libby. Um, just before we get started, are the slides coming through okay? Do they look good size? Uh, is it pretty they readable? Look good. All right. Uh, so like Libby mentioned, um, my name is Jeremy, and I was the release lead for 120. And joining me today is Kirsten. She was the enhancements lead for 120. Um, I work at VMware. Uh, I do... Uh, I work on an internal platform, so my team uh, runs Kubernetes. I build things on top of Kubernetes, um, do a lot of things like that. So it was really interesting to participate in the release. And I think there's a couple of really awesome things that I'm looking forward to deploying uh, in 120 whenever we get around to upgrading to that. Um, Kirsten, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Kirsten. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on uh, the machine config operator, which is an operator in OpenShift. Um, and I've been on the enhancements team, I think since 1.17, um, being a bug share shadow, enhancement shadow a couple times, and the enhancements lead uh, last release. So that's a great experience. And I think we'll talk about that um, a little bit at the end of the presentation as well. So if you have any questions um, about that process, we're happy to talk. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that you had been a, a bug triage shadow in 117. So we started around the same time. I was an enhancement shadow in 117. It's a pretty pretty cool coincidence. Time flies oh, when you have fun, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's it's been been a, a quite a quite a journey. Uh, all the things happening. So uh, we're here today to talk about the Kubernetes 120 release, um, which we lovingly called the Radist release. Whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, first and foremost, uh, this is a big, big release. Uh, we'll see some some numbers in a little bit, but uh, really, this was a, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Kubernetes release in quite some time. Um, one of the fun things that a release lead gets to do is to pick uh, the theme, pick uh, like a mascot or a logo, and in, in this case, I wanted to pay homage a little bit to Kubernetes 114. Um, that release was known as Caternetes. And Caternetes, um, if you hadn't seen it, was this really great picture with the Kubernetes logo and a bunch of cats. Um, so I wanted to pay kind of tribute to that and uh, and just have a little bit of fun. 2020 was kind of a rough year in a lot of ways um, and just wanted to end the year with a little bit of fun. So here's my cat uh, and we styled him up in uh, kind of like 1990s school pictures <laughs> with lasers in the background. Um, uh, he's a very, fun, happy, happy guy. So kind of captured my uh, my feelings. Like the release was really fun. Everybody was super positive the whole time, despite all the things going on. So it just kind of kind of set the stage for me. Yeah, it was definitely um, a great experience. And I looked for, I, it was the thing I looked forward to a lot last year, like all of my meetings and participation was, it was just a really nice thing. Yeah, definitely a highlight for me for the year. Yeah. Okay, so today we are going to start off by giving you a little bit of an update on 121 and what you can expect and what you can expect just generally around releases going forward. Then we'll talk a little bit about 120 um, in, in numbers, uh, just kind of look at that compared to other releases. And then we'll run through some highlights and show you what's new from each one of the SIGs. Um, we'll go through that kind of in a, a rapid fashion because there's so many of them this time around. And we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. 
So first up, the 121 release updates. Uh, 121 is actually going on right now. Uh, it started a few weeks ago. And the next major milestone you really need to be aware of, uh, if you're kind of following along, is that Enhancements Freeze is going to come on February 9th. So uh, coming up pretty quickly. Uh, and that'll set the stage for the release on April 8th. So kind of between there, you'll have a bunch of milestones. A really important one will be Code Freeze. Around those two dates, you'll get a pretty good understanding of, uh, of what's going on. Um, and we'll talk about how you can kind of dig into those things as we walk through some of these issues. But one thing to be aware of is that um, you know, if you look back at one at 2020, the year, uh, there were only three Kubernetes releases. So 120 was the third release of the year, and it was the last release of the year. In previous um, years, there have been four releases, so generally like one a quarter. But because of all of the uncertainty and the kind of the turmoil of 2020, the 119 release became pretty long and extended, uh, and that really ate up most of the year. So when we got to the 120 release, we didn't have enough time to do another release after that. It was it ended up being at the end of the year. There's been some ongoing discussion about whether that's the right cadence or not. Do we go back to four releases? Do we go to three releases? And there's pros and cons in, in both directions. Um, I think the decision for this is hopefully going to be made around enhancements freeze. So in a few weeks, we'll have a better understanding of what, what it's going to look like going forward for the you know, the 122, 123, 124 releases when they'll land. But if you're interested in this at all, uh, and you would like to provide feedback, uh, we've linked to um, a, a discussion on GitHub that you can go to. Uh, this is using the new GitHub discussions feature uh, where you can provide your feedback and what your thoughts are on the release cadence. Uh, we would really, really recommend and encourage you to go and add any feedback, positive or negative, to three releases or four releases. You know, when we, the, you know, when SIG release and the community are building these releases out and, and you know, pushing forward with new Kubernetes versions, it's really for the community and the people that are going to consume the releases. So we really want to make sure that we're, you know, satisfying the desires of the community uh, and balancing that with the needs of the contributors. Okay, so now the, the super exciting part of the presentation where we're going to talk about <laughs> the new things that are in 120, and there are so many. Uh, so we'll start out, Kristen, do you want to give us a little bit of background on sure. uh, the numbers? Sure. So um, as Jeremy said, it was actually quite a large release. Um, it was a bit hectic, but there was also a lot of sort of pent up demand for enhancements. So, you know, a good number of them were in a really great state by the time we started the release. And then we had sort of the normal amount of enhancements that also um, went through the process like normally, like uh, one step at a time. So we had 44 total enhancements um, in 120, and to compare that to 117, which I believe was the same sort of time period, um, there were 22 in that time, which seems a little low, but um, you can see that we had a lot more than the prior year. Um, so we had 16 stable enhancements, which are basically GA, um, which is, I think, up probably we had eight in the previous release. Um, we have 15 graduating to beta, 11 uh, new alpha features, two deprecations, which we started tracking. And then something that I think is really cool to think about, like there were at least like five new authors, like people who are sort of new to the enhancements process and um, really getting involved with KEPs and, you know, adding features. And I think that as we get more new authors participating. It's also going to decrease the load on everyone else, but also bring in some great contributors and great ideas. So um, I just wanted to highlight that in case anybody in the audience is interested in, you know, doing an enhancement. Um, this is also open to new people by collaborating with the SIGs and really just working to get your, your features in, and it is, uh, it is possible. So yeah, these are like pretty huge numbers and um, I think everybody should be really proud of, of what they accomplished yeah. last release. I, I totally agree. I think there's two really important things to just hammer in on there. One, um, you know, this this was an end of year release. And typically, if you go back and look at 117 and previous end of year releases, you know, they overlap with holiday seasons, they overlap with KubeCon. Mm -hmm. There's so many other pressing concerns that come in that, you know, the, the bandwidth for getting these things worked on and hitting code freeze on time um, generally just kind of limits the number of things that are, has limited the things in the past. I think this shows that it's not necessarily true that the, the kind of um, 
view that the end of your release is a, a bug fix release or a stability release or um, it's kind of a waste isn't really true. I think this showed that uh, with proper planning, I think the extended 119 timeframe gave us give all the SIGs more opportunity to get things you know planned out and ready to go. That it uh, it doesn't really have to be um, you know a waste. And then just generally, uh, your, your last point there that at least five new authors are responsible. You know, enhancements are how we track new things coming into Kubernetes. So if you have an idea for something, you know the, the way to, to get that done is through writing cap writing a Kubernetes enhancement proposal. And that tracks through this process, the new features, the beta things, and finally the things that have graduated to stable. Um, so I, I think it's just really, really cool to see, you know, of that number, a good chunk of them were, were brand new people. It's not just the same old people contributing to the release. Yeah, I think it's really exciting. And, you know, hopefully that number increases as well. Like, I think that that may be something that we track. Um, in future releases, I think that'd be really nice. Yeah, I think that that's a, a great point. All right, so we're gonna go through all of the, the various SIGs and show you the new things, the things that have gone to stable uh, that you can start counting on. Um, just one kind of quick thing to, to mention, uh, we, we mentioned alpha, beta, and stable. Uh, the real difference between those things is that alpha um, is not turned on by default. So you'll, you, if you want to use these features, there are generally feature gates that you have to turn on on the API server or um, configuration options you need to pass to the kubelet. Beta are turned on by default. So you can turn them off if you need to, but by default, they're turned on. And then uh, for alpha and beta things, there's no guarantee for backwards compatibility. Those things can go away. And there's actually a policy put in place starting with 120 that things have to promote to beta or sorry, from beta to stable, or they need to go away. Um, I think we'll see some more deprecations down the line kind of falling out of that. Uh, but once they get to stable, you can have some guarantees that those things will be there for, uh, for a much longer period of time. And the and we're also in the cap mm -hmm. starting to include the production readiness review, which I believe also includes um, considerations about upgrades and downgrades. Yeah. So um, we're, we're trying to add more sort of safety measures into it before things go uh, before features are submitted into into the upstream. Yeah, definitely. Um, so th we're, let's jump into a couple of highlights before we, you know, things that you should really, really be aware of from this release and uh, before we dive into the specifics from each thing. And the first one that I think everybody is aware of is uh, Docker Shim has been deprecated in this release. And that sounds really scary. And there was a lot of uh, traffic on the internet and a lot of effort from contributors to come and write blogs to kind of, you know, set some of those fears aside. Um, but it's not as scary as it sounds. Uh, this is just another example of, of things that have been beta or not, be, you know, have been not stable uh, existing for a long time and kind of the pressure to, to move those things along or get rid of them. Um, Docker Shim in particular is pretty old and has been in Kubernetes for quite a long time, you know, predating uh, adding container runtime interface. So things like containerd and um, cryo. Uh, Docker Shim was a separate code path that existed in the kubelet and, you know, just introduced another area that had to be maintained and uh, is kind of backfitting, you know, you know the, do the Docker engine into the kubelet. Uh, Mirantis, uh, for anybody that wants to continue using the Docker engine like that, uh, Mirantis is going to work on a um, CRI implementation around that. So you'll be able to use the same kind of functionality. But you can find a ton of information on uh, the Kubernetes blog um, that kind of points you in the right direction. And you'll see some more of this coming along. Uh, but the big takeaway here is that you know, Docker is not going away. And um, even the support for the Docker shim isn't going to go away. Starting in 120, when you start up the node and you're using, or start up the kubelet and you're using this feature, uh, you'll just see a deprecation warning. Things will continue to work as is for a, a few more releases. Uh, so you have time uh, to, to kind of get around this. Okay, uh, so there's two other areas that we wanted to highlight real quick. Um, stability work, and then uh, some cool new things. And I think playing off of that Docker shim deprecation, uh, we see some foundational work along CRI to move that towards beta. It's been uh, alpha for so long. It was introduced in the 1.5 release. So we're on 120 now. And think about you know if we're doing four releases a year normally, that's been there for quite a while. The same thing for cron jobs. Um, that was actually introduced as scheduled jobs before it was called cron jobs, but in 1.8, it became cron jobs and became beta. So another one that's been there for, for a pretty decent amount of time. 
Um, another stability sort of thing, uh, exec probes. Um, so if you've ever uh, set up uh, an exec probe for a pod, uh, there is a field uh, for the timeout. Actually, that timeout was never honored. So this is kind of an, a longstanding bug that's been fixed. Uh, we'll, we'll hit that one a little bit. And then just generally, um, SigNode has had a lot of things in this release. There were something like 13 or 14 uh, enhancement issues that were just owned by SigNode. And of those, five of them graduated to stable. So there's a big push in this in this release. And I think we're going to see that in, in releases coming up to push some of these things that have been beta for a long time into that, that kind of stable, uh, stable camp. And then, of course, there are, there are some new things. And I think this is where it's really exciting for me as a, a cluster operator, because some of these new things are really great in terms of um, you know, just making my life as a cluster operator better, my life as a person deploying resources and workloads better. Um, graceful node shutdown. Uh, so when the node is going to shut down, Kubelet can become aware of that, and it can you know, properly send signals to the workloads instead of just kind of going away. Uh, better metrics for like what resources are being consumed in the cluster rather than uh, you know having to cobble this together. There will be a, starting in 120, a nice um, metrics endpoint where you'll be able to get a good view of requests versus limits and, and make better planning decisions going on from the scheduling point of view. Uh, another really cool one, I think, is the ability to auto scale based on container resources instead of a pod. So generally, if you're using the HPA, um, you know, it looks at the pod metrics. So if you have one a multi-container pod and one of those things is uh, maybe skewing that result, either you know positively or negatively, you couldn't really scale based off of the individual containers. And starting in 120, you'll be able to do that. And then finally, there's a bunch of security-related improvements that have come along, I think, that are not really new, new, but they're new in the sense that they're fixing some problems and making things just a little bit uh, better all around. OK, so let's jump into the SIG updates. And for this one, Kirsten and I are going to go back and forth um, and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of these things. Uh, Kirsten, do you want to start with API Machinery? Oh, sure. Um, API Machinery had, I think, four um, four enhancements. Uh, I think two beta, one alpha, and one stable. So we have the priority and fairness um, for API server requests, which is now beta. And there's like a ton of work that's been going into that. Um, it's been really great. We also have the deprecation of the self-link field, um, which was alpha and 116. They've been waiting a year between each. So then four releases from now, I think they're aiming uh, to finish that in 124. So they're spacing that out and you know really communicating that through their caps and other communications, which is like pretty great to see. And for any of the any questions that you have on any of this, you know, there's the tracking issues, enhancement proposals, as well as the, you know, other comments that come from the release. Um, but that's been that's been pretty great. Um, we do have the default built in API types defaults, um, which is going to go into the go IDL, and it's going to be transformed into an OPI open API default field and then route it to defaulting function so that it can be done declaratively. Um, and that's stable uh, in 120. Um, and then we have this cube API server identity, which is a which is for uh, HA clusters and also like a prereq for other HA features. So it's, you know, semi-foundational work. And I think that that's going to be really interesting. Um, where you have each cube server self-assigning a unique ID during bootstrap and storing in a lease object, and then controllers will have access to the list of those um, living cube API servers in the cluster. So that's some pretty great work that's going on as well. All right, next up, apps. Um, oh, so I think we mentioned this already. This was the previous scheduled jobs, cron jobs. Um, we're trying to not have things sit in any stage forever and actually like move through the process. And this is one of those. Um, this is for all time related actions like backups, report generation, so that each of the tasks can run repeatedly or at any given point in time. Um, and this is moving to beta. Um, and I think it's gonna be dual support. So the V1 of the controllers is still available. Yeah, that's exactly true. All right, and architecture. Oh, sorry. 
So this is a conformance test without beta REST APIs or features. And I, I guess we would call this like a stability room. Would you, would you put this under stability or? Yeah, I think so. I think an interesting thing is that, you know, we don't really track um, everything as a cap, right? Like, so things that are kind of process related and this one to me feels kind of process related, kind of internal. Yeah. Um, and that, that's true for some of the security things uh, that, that came in the yeah. release as well. But it's, you know, it's interesting to see um, you know the work is happening kind of behind the scenes that you may not directly um, use. But I think this conformance testing stuff is super cool uh, because they're making sure that you know these releases are adhering to the contract that they say they're adhering to, and that as a release goes forward, mm -hmm. um, people can still meet that conformance requirement. It was really cool, just as as an aside to uh, to see all of the the work that. Um, the conformance group had been doing, you know, and identifying things that hadn't been covered by any testing and, and working to get that done for, uh, you know, during the 120 cycle. Um, and they have a website uh, that you can hit um, called API Snoop. That is really cool and it'll show you like when a test was introduced mm. and what things are covered and what things aren't covered. Uh, so if you're on the Kubernetes Slack, there's a conformance, conformance channel um, that has a lot of really great people working out of it. And if you're interested in any of that stuff, it's a great place yeah. to go. And I believe the API Snoop actually came in handy um, during one sort of critical critical feature that we were trying to merge. So like this extra tooling is so valuable to I think the community and all of the hard work that goes into it is, I don't know if, if people don't know about it, it's like, if you knew about it, you would greatly appreciate it because I think it helps us all. So thanks to everybody working on that. All right, and then off. Um, this one uh, was one of our late breaking issues kind of came in towards the end. I think it's pretty cool because it's, uh, you know, breaking out cr uh, credential providers. There's a, a similar issue um, that we'll see uh, for Node, but uh, you know, really this is allowing you to specify different ways of um, doing authentication and allowing you to do these things out outside of the tree. You know, if you look back at kind of the history of the Kubernetes repo, there were a lot of things that were built in tree and there's work right now to move those things out because they don't necessarily need to, to be released and versioned with each Kubernetes release, some of the cloud provider stuff. And this was uh, some of the work that it was necessary to kind of unblock some of that other work. Here we have a security related one, um, improving the security of uh, service accounts. I think that's always a, a nice benefit. And again, this is beta. So anything that you see here that says beta uh, will be available to use out of the box with 120. some more security account stuff, um, the ability to uh, provide OIDC discovery endpoints. That'd be pretty useful. Okay, and then on to auto scaling. So I mentioned this one in the uh, kind of overview highlight section, but uh, this is the ability to use the HPA to scale based off of an individual container instead of the aggregated pod usage. Um, it does this by adding a new container resource type. So if you're familiar with the, the YAML for defining um, HPA, then uh, under metrics, you'll be able to define new metrics that are at the container level and, and make those scaling decisions based off of that. I think that's really cool as you start getting these kind of complicated multi-pod, excuse me, multi-pod, um, or sorry, multi-container pods, uh, things with sidecars that may or may not, you know, help you with that kind of aggregated uh, view of the resource consumption. All right, uh, CLI. So there's a few in CLI that are interesting to look at. Um, this one is uh, kubectl debug, and it's going to beta in this release. Um, this is cool for me because I was the enhancements lead for 118, and this came as an alpha feature. And I think it's really cool to see these, uh, you know, these kind of useful um, things come to kubectl. Uh, so this one particularly kind of pairs with the ephemeral containers work that's happening. And uh, if you think about when you're deploying workloads to Kubernetes and um, you know you, you try to shrink that image down as much as possible to reduce the attack surface, right? So maybe you're using a distroless image, maybe you're using a scratch image. It doesn't necessarily have tools you might need to debug a production problem. And that's where kubectl debug and, and, uh, and the ephemeral containers work kind of come together to allow you to maybe add another container to that pod that'll allow you to, to do some more debugging there. Or maybe make a copy of it if you want to go and do some uh, kind of looking at it after the fact. Uh, to use this previously, you would have had to use that extra field um, kubectl alpha debug. 
uh, because it's graduating to beta on the road to stable, you don't you no longer need to do that. And it becomes kind of a first class citizen that you can use. All right, next up is cloud provider. Kirsten, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so this um, so support out of tree Azure cloud provider is something that Jeremy talked before. I think in the maybe client growth uh, client growth slide. I think where we're um, moving certain things out of the KK repo, um, and I think that it's going to be really helpful. They like. Different different teams have trouble keeping up with the releases, or that cadence also like isn't uh, the best for them. So even just from a development standpoint, I think that you know being in your own repo and then running Cloud Controller Manager is gonna really sort of clean up the interface and also clean up the just the process of developing on some of this. Um, so that's pretty cool. All right. Uh, cluster lifecycle. So this one is kind of a new feature, but it's really a deprecation. And I think this one's a really cool one to see in 120. Um, it's starting to address the use of you know non-inclusive language. There's a kind of community-wide effort um, with the inclusive language initiative and working group naming inside of Kubernetes to to look at you know things we use, uh, terms we use, and, and and find better uses, things that are more inclusive, things that um, don't have uh, you know, bad connotations associated with the words. So in this case, kubeadm is starting to uh, replace uh, some of the tainted labels that would have been applied to um, previously, like the master nodes, uh, and that's becoming control plane node. So this is marked as a deprecation because the um, the, the existing uh, you know master taint and label is being removed and it's being replaced with this control plane um, one instead. Uh, so again, because it's a deprecation, you'll be able to continue using that existing word, but you should really start to migrate towards this new one, uh, starting with 120. And I think this one was really... And this isn't like a trivial amount of work either, you know, like this is like, this I think people put a lot of thought into and, you know, naming anything is hard and renaming things is even yes. harder. So, you know, this is a lot of effort and I think that it's really appreciated by a lot of yeah, people. Yeah, 100% agree. So that was the only one uh, for that for that SIG. Uh, let's move on to instrumentation now. And there's a few in here that I think are really cool. Um, I think we mentioned this one before earlier as well. Uh, again, just like my my bias towards the things that I think are, are cool. But um, as a cluster operator, uh, one of the challenges we have is just getting a really good view about who's using what. You know, so we have to go do specific queries. Uh, we have to look at a lot of the things that are running. Um, you know, is this does this deployment, the single pod, actually need 16 CPUs, or could it be reduced? Um, and kind of right-sizing all of that stuff in the cluster, and also figuring out, you know, what capacity are we going to need down the road? Um, you know, it's it's not a, a unified single picture right now. But what's going to be cool in 120 is that there's this new feature that will enable a new metrics endpoint to be scraped. So you'll be able to use Prometheus or whatever to scrape this endpoint and get a view of all of the resources that are being consumed from a scheduling standpoint. So the decisions that the scheduler would make are you know, reflected by uh, requests and limits and what the node has available. Um, you know, is the node overcommitted or not? And all of these things would be bubbled up to a single endpoint that you can scrape and get a much better view of, uh, of what's happening in the cluster. Uh, I'm really looking forward to using this in our environment when we get to 120. Uh, a security-related uh, one here. Um, this is related to the security audit that happened in Kubernetes. Um, and two of the findings were related to logging of sensitive information. Um, so this is work that went into um, kind of applying a logging filter that can be applied to all the Kubernetes logging components to make sure that sensitive information doesn't end up in logs. You know, this is a, another really great one if you're running Kubernetes in, uh, in production, and especially if you're in any kind of environment that has uh, you know, compliance concerns or security concerns, which is probably everybody, uh, this will be a, a great feature to have. And then another one that is really like more of a process sort of thing, uh, this is defending against logging of secrets of the um, of the infrastructure. So when a job runs in Prow, or in, in, when you make a PR to Kubernetes, um, Prow is responsible for running all of the, the tests and whatnot. And what what's cool here is that this is the ability to um, use, using static analysis to figure out is any of this stuff likely to uh, to leak information. Um, if it is, then that, that PR will fail. So this is kind of adding some more upfront 
uh, guards to make sure that we're, we're, we're shipping secure software by default. All right, next up is SIG Network. Uh, Kirsten, back to you. And I think just as a note, like um, for SIG instrumentation, that's not a huge SIG, you know? So they've landed mm -hmm. like three pretty large, three, three substantive enhancements, you know, in one release. And, you know, I, I think that sometimes we also, um, from the outside looking in, like overestimate how many people are working on things. So just as a reminder, like some of these things are a few people doing this work. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to kind of call that out because they, they, they've been doing a lot of, a lot, like a lot of hustling on these things and it's pretty great. Yeah, that's a totally great shout. I 100% agree with that. So um, for network, we have a couple things, well, more than a couple, but <laughs> for alpha we have IPv4, IPv6 dual stack support um, that I think a lot of people have been looking forward to. We have graduating to GA, um, FCTP support for services pod and point of network policy. Uh, let's see. We also have new endpoint API that's beta. And this is a case where it didn't go to beta, it's staying in beta, but they did some substantive work um, in this release. And so we track that work to make sure that it can get in. They, I think, added the node name to the endpoint slice API. Um, so it's not always that everything has just graduated, but sometimes there's also significant amounts of work going in between, you know, the sort of name status changes. So you mm -hmm. might see something that is alpha and then it's, and then you're like, well, why didn't it go to beta? Why is it still an alpha? Well, they might still be landing some things that they think are important to have an alpha. They might be doing some sort of foundational work. Um, and that's, I think, the case for this. There's, there's a lot of work going on into this. I think that was the case for the dual stack uh, as well. I think that was a huge, so. huge rewrite of it that they, they thankfully yeah. landed in 120 and not 119. And so we have another alpha, um, which is support of mixed protocols and services with type load balancer. Um, and this is alpha and 120, and it's behind the mixed protocol LB service feature gate, um, like Jeremy was mentioning before, um, about alpha features. We have stable, uh, adding app protocol to services and endpoints. Um, with the endpoint slice beta released in 1.17, uh, app protocol was added that would allow the application protocols to be specified per port. Um, and the CAP is basically adding support for that same attribute to services and endpoints. The feature gate is supposed to be removed in 121. Um, so yeah. And then we have uh, tracking terminating endpoints so that we can handle terminating endpoints gracefully. Um, this is the endpoint slice API inter includes a terminating condition. And uh, again, it's under feature gate if the feature gate is enabled, so this is alpha. And then we have disabled node ports for service type load balancer. Um, this is good for bare metal on-prem environments that rely on VIP based uh, load balancing implementations, uh, which is I think probably a lot of users. So I think they're gonna be happy with this as well. And this is alpha, so. Ooh, no. Oh, the big one. <laughs> this is the big one. <laughs> it is the big one. And uh, I, I think it's really cool to see all of the work that Node has done this, this cycle. There were actually a few more uh, that didn't make it into this this release um, that you'll yeah. see in 121. Um, just like kudos to, to the Node team for all of the stuff they've been doing. And uh, kudos to Elena, um, who's been kind of working on getting prioritization for 121 and yeah. and really making sure that they have a great story and some planning going forward. Uh, so the first one. So they're planning while they're, they're planning while they're doing the enhancement. So like these are the same, basically the same people yeah. doing the implementation work and the planning work and the architecture work and all of the, all of the review. So, I mean, this is like a tremendous amount of. Yeah. I think it's it's really impressive to see, and uh, I'm I'm really excited to see how much lands in 121 too. Yeah. So here is another deprecation. Um, so we had a uh, deprecation back a little bit ago. Um, we also had the, the Thackershim deprecation. Uh, so this one is kind of simplifying down the number of um, streaming requests that can happen to a node. Um, again, this is. Uh, 
an area where there's multiple code paths and it's com complicated, configuration is hard in the end users, and it just opens you up to more security problems. So this is condensing things down. Um, you can read the, uh, the tracking issue. Uh, we'll make these slides available after the fact, uh, but you can get, dig into this to see exactly uh, what you need to be aware of going forward. And then um, we'll start with the stable things and kind of move to beta and, and alpha. Uh, there were 14 things in this release, uh, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, this one is runtime classes. So this allows you to basically uh, have multiple runtimes in a cluster and specify which one you want to use for different workloads in the pod spec. That's going to stable. So it's been around for a little bit, uh, going to stable, we can count on it going forward. PID limiting. This one's really cool. Another security related thing, uh, graduating to stable. And this allows you to do PID isolation between pods as well as node to pods. Uh, adding pod startup liveness probes. So another one that's graduating to stable. Um, this allows you to, if you haven't used it, uh, allows you to um, define uh, kind of a startup uh, delay for um, all the other, before any other probes happen uh, on your, your uh, pod lifecycle. Uh, so this one is going directly to stable. It's really a bug fix, but it's a bug fix that has pretty deep implications. And we actually saw this um, towards the end of the release. Excuse me. Um, uh, a report came from uh, some of our friends at Azure. Uh, they had some exec probes in some of their pipelines, and those things took more than a minute. And previously, that timeout was never was never honored. Uh, Kubelet would just continue forever um, if you define an exec probe and something took you know five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, now, starting in 120, uh, the default is, is respected, and the default is one minute. So if you don't specify a timeout for the exec probe, it will uh, actually it's, it's one second. I think um, it will default to that one second timeout. So things that previously had worked uh, no, may no longer work. So there is a feature gate uh, that you can turn on. Um, call it exec probe timeout. Uh, that will go away in the future. So this is really just kind of a helping you get over the hump of um, fixing your, your workloads that may or may not be impacted by that. Uh, Third-party device monitoring plugins. Again, this is another thing uh, you know, where things have moved out of tree, uh, supporting things that are out of tree. This is finally going to stable as well. Next up, uh, the beta issues. So this one is Node Topology Manager. So this allows you to use different kind of hardware resources for different parts of the, the Kubernetes um, components. And uh, this is really you know, going to beta now, so it's turned on by default. Uh, you'll be able to use this kind of out of the box, and that's, that's pretty cool. Another one that's going to beta is allowing you to set the FQDN as the host name for your pods. Um, so you know, generally, uh, this is another field. Um, you would have been able to set host name subdomain before. Uh, now this field set host name as FQDN uh, is just available in the pod spec that you can just use going forward. Um, this is kind of a deprecation. Uh, it's removing some metrics that are really for GPU. Uh, and there are three of them that are going to be deprecated. So they're turned off by default in, in this one. Um, memory total, memory use, and duty cycle. And this will really, really only impact GPU users. So if you're using GPUs, uh, this is a good one to be aware of. Um, support to size memory-backed volumes. Uh, this is another one. Um, if you use empty dir volumes in the past, uh, size limit was not used to actually to bound it. Uh, it was used for eviction purposes. Uh, now it's going to be used to create a a, re a resource of that size so that it's portable between cluster providers. Um, you know, different different cluster environments, you might have gotten different behaviors. It's just kind of simplifying that down. Uh, this one's an alpha feature, so to use it, you have to turn on that that uh, feature gate. Sorry, that feature gate. Um, but in subsequent releases, you'll be able to just take advantage of this one. Graceful node shutdown, another really useful one that I'm looking forward to. Um, so this one is, uh, you know, basically just making the kubelet aware that the node is going to shut down and propagating that signal down to the pod so they can shut down uh, without, you know, just being killed uh, and unexpectedly go away. CRI support. Uh, so this one was introduced, I think, in Kubernetes 1.5, you know, way back when. And it's going to go to beta probably in 1.21. Um, there was some work that needed to happen kind of before that could happen. Part of that was deprecating the Docker shim. A few other things had to happen. So again, it's marked as alpha here. It's staying in alpha, but there was a lot of work that um, starts that train down the road. And then another alpha feature, um, adding huge page support to the downward API. Uh, so 
Downward API allows you to project things into the cluster, or sorry, into the pod. Um, you previously could not use huge pages with that. So this can give you uh, size and limits for huge, huge pages into the Downward API, previously not available. Um, kind of going back to that client Go uh, one we mentioned earlier, uh, this allows you to use exec plugins and pull um, image pull secrets and stuff uh, for the kubelet using these external plugins. So two new flags come to the kubelet, um, and then there's a, uh, a YAML resource where you can define how these things should work. So basically, it will it will run some external um, executable uh, to get the credentials and make them available to to, uh, to the kubelet. So Node right. had five. Alpha and five GA with yeah. you know three beta, which is pretty tremendous. Like I, I'm just that's a lot of work. That's a lot yeah. of work for one of the busiest one of the busiest things with the most requests. Yeah, and think about um, you know that touches so many different things. So when when those things go through, mm -hmm. it may not just be Signo that has to reboot things. There may be <laughs> yeah, I reviews yes. that have to come in. There may be you know storage things that has to be reviewed. It's really a, a team effort and. and a lot of people depend on that work, and it's it's not a lot of people doing the work. So kudos to them. All right, scheduling. Kirsten, do you want to take this one? Sure. Um, this would be add a configurable default constraint to pod topology spread. Um, the spreading rules are going to be defined in the pod spec and tied to the pod. So this is going to add defaults and allow cluster operators to define spread. Um, this is beta, so available by default, I guess. And we're moving right. into, store. Store. just as a note for storage, um, they've also done, they've put in a huge amount of effort to really refine their, their cat's handling process, uh, the young and Michelle out, like they've just been doing so much work um, that just as an enhancement suite, I just have to give a shout out because they've made it really easy, like in the past couple of enhancements to really get the caps through, get the code reviewed and get everything merged. So. Um, there's a lot of organizational work going on behind the scenes as well that he doesn't get acknowledged, but like we really appreciate you guys. So this would be the GA for snapshot restore volume support for Kubernetes. Um, and this is going to provide the standard API design and PV snapshot restore for CSI volume drivers. Um, this is beta, so this is skip uh, volume ownership change, and this will allow a user to optionally skip recursive ownership and permission change on a volume if the volume already has right permission. Uh, and this is allow CSI drivers to opt in to volume ownership and change. This is going to be beta, adding a new field called CSI driver spec FS group policy. And then this is the service account token for CSI driver, uh, basically using CSI service account token, plumbing it down uh, to the pod service account token CSI driver. Um, this allows you to obtain service account tokens for pods that CSI drivers are mounting volumes for. All right, the last Windows. one, Windows. <laughs> this one's pretty cool, I think. Um, Again, another one I think that I remember from 118 pretty distinctly, uh, having ha having been at Microsoft for a while, um, it's really cool to see the things that have been happening with Windows support in Kubernetes. You know, like when you think Kubernetes, you, you may or may not think Windows containers, and it's really cool to see this work happening. There were some more things that uh, Sig Windows was trying to land towards the end of the cycle unfortunately didn't make it in. Um, but this one I think is a pretty huge, huge win, right? You're, you're getting CRI support for Windows and that's a stable thing in Kubernetes 120 now. I think it opens up uh, a lot of possibilities for people that for whatever reason, you know, can't migrate off of Windows or you know, are just Windows based shops and that their workloads depend on that. Um, this is just making it more inclusive for them to be able to take advantage of all of the benefits of using Kubernetes. So I think we quickly rolled through all of those enhancements um, via the slides that are gonna be provided by Libby afterwards. We've like provided all the links to the CAPS 
and to the issue tracker so that you can kind of dig into those and get a little more detail or ask the questions. Um, but also, like, these are obviously, like, substantive caps. These aren't just, like, you know, bug fixes going in at the end of the year. Like, this mm -hmm. is a lot. This represents a ton of work that people have done um, throughout those months, especially, like, in a really tough year. So it's been pretty amazing. Yeah. I, I was... Uh... I wasn't sure what to expect coming in to the, you know, to lead this. Room. I think um, just thinking like the rest of the year and and kind of getting, you know, I was the shadow for the lead shadow for 119 and kind of seeing all the turmoil and the changes that were happening and how we were responding to concerns from contributors. And at one point we said, should we even do a 119 release with uh, how the year was going? So I was super unsure how 120 was going to go, but uh, you know, in the end, I think it was super exciting. I think there were so many things done by so many people, just so much good work that um, you know, 120 is. I'm I'm really proud of it. Yeah, yeah. Proud, of, proud of the whole release I team. Agree. Proud of all the contributors. I think it was just it was a great experience for me. And kind of along those lines of it being a great experience, uh, you know, this is a volunteer job, right? We are not paid by Kubernetes to be the release lead or the enhancement <laughs> lead. Um, the, everything in Kubernetes is really the community. Um, some people are paid. Uh, like full disclosure, my job allows me to do uh, some of this work, but it's not my full time job. And I volunteered to do this, you know, back in one seventeen. Um, to shadow enhancements. And that's really how you get started with this. So if, if you're interested in being on the release team for 122 or, or any of the releases after that, the way to start that is with the release team shadow program. Um, so I've been through that. Kirsten's been through that. Uh, Nabaroon, who's leading 121 right now, um, we shadowed together in 117. Uh, there's, there's lots of opportunity. Um, there's lots of demand too, uh, just kind of full disclosure there. But I mean, we wanted to give you a little bit of information about the release team program and uh, the shadow program and, and let you know where to look, uh, when to look, and just kind of more information. So, And if you have any questions about it, like definitely feel free to reach out. Um, like Jeremy was saying, like the workload really varies on the team. So I think like if you're interested in the program, like asking, ask, talk, trying to talk to people like during a quiet time about what those expectations be, might be. Um, it's really helpful. But I'd also just reiterate what Jeremy was saying where like people forget that the release just doesn't happen by itself, you know? Like there's not just people like doing random pull requests and that's it. Like there's a lot of work that the SIGs have to do outside of just coding. There's a lot of like architectural and organizational work that they have to put in that, you know, um, I think we don't appreciate enough. And then the release itself doesn't doesn't really come to fruition without the entire release team put together with all of these shadows and all of these other teams and all of these things that you might not always think about like docs or release notes or bug triage. We have a huge CI signal effort like underway as well to get CI stabilized. Um, all of these are like really important parts of getting a great release that, you know, it's not just like, can this PR go in or can I get this feature? Like there's a ton of work that gets done. And I think, any help that anybody wants to provide would also be welcome because it takes, it takes, I guess, to be corny, it takes a village, right? Like yeah. It's not just the one thing that you're looking for. There, there's a ton of people doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Yeah, definitely um, would recommend this to anybody that's interested. Uh, one of the comments that I remember from the cycle uh, was Rob, who was the CI, from 120, uh, Rob, who was the CI signal lead, um, likened the release team to uh, Montessori school for Kubernetes. So Montessori school <laughs> is, is a method of, uh, of educating kids where you can go and you kind of figure out what the kid's good at and what the kid wants to do and they can go from thing to thing and gives them exposure to a lot of different things. And the release team is definitely that way. Um, you might think that the release team is only experienced contributors and that's not true. I think when we pick shadows, we definitely look for a mix. Um, when I was an enhancements lead, I picked uh, a mix of people. Um, I picked John Bellamarek, uh, you know, one of the leads from SIG Architecture. Um, I picked Kirsten, who had a lot of experience with OpenShift and Kubernetes. I picked people who were brand new to the project. Because uh, I think you get great experience um, for those people, but you also get a lot of great uh, insights that you may or may not 
have otherwise gotten. Like that, that kind of diversity in people really helps build up those really solid teams. Um, so the way you do this is by applying. Uh, if you are not subscribed uh, to Kubernetes Dev, the mailing list, we definitely recommend that. Uh, towards the end of each release, uh, a application is sent out and you can uh, select a, a few roles. Um, if you go to the Kubernetes, uh, sorry, the SIG release repo on GitHub, so github.com slash Kubernetes uh, SIG release, you can find the handbooks for each one of these roles. And it'll give you a much better idea about what kind of time commitment or what the actual you know, job of that that role is. You know, you're thinking, what's enhancements do? Um, what does CI signal do? Each one of those handbooks gives you a really good idea about what, uh, what, what that team does. And I think these are great because they can kind of springboard you into doing more of that stuff. So if you're, if you're interested in CI signal, it can set you up to do a lot of really great things with, with SIG, sorry, with SIG testing, because there's a really, really tight integration between what the release team's CI signal team does and what SIG testing is doing, you know, tracking down flakes and tests, uh, you know, figuring out, is this really a problem or not? Um, you know, that team was super critical to us at the end of the release. Uh, and, and again, like that uh, three months thing, kind of tying back to our release cadence, um, that may change uh, depending on what happens with the release cadence going forward. All right, I guess with that, we can open it up to questions now. Um, can scroll back to the chat and see if there's any anything. Uh... Go to the top where it says general and click Q&A. All right, thank you. Have them right in there. Yeah, so the first question, um, could the presenters opine on the fact that most enterprises are still uh, toward trailing the adoption of, of 116? Um, my team specifically just upgraded to 116, so I definitely feel that. And I think that really is an important one to consider for the release cadence. Um, there was some work by the by a working group called LTS, um, working group LTS, but they, um, you know, they were kind of looking at supportability. So, how long does a given Kubernetes release uh, stay in support for? Right now, it's three releases, so that's not that long. Uh, their their work was looking at how do we shift that towards a year. Um, and it, there's a lot of things that go into that. You know, maintaining old branches is extra work. Um, you know, if fixes come along to, to like go and you need to rebuild all of the components, um, that's extra work. And a lot of that's done by the SIG release. Um, but just in general, as these, this train kind of continues, it's really hard to keep up. And I definitely feel that. Um, I think that going to three releases uh, from a you know consumer standpoint makes it a little easier for us. There's less kind of train to have to keep up with. Um, that 116 upgrade, uh, if you haven't done it yet, is is a challenge. Uh, there were a lot of breaking breaking things that happened in there. Uh, deprecated things that had been deprecated for quite a long time were finally removed, so it was quite impactful. Um, I think uh, you know we, we tried not to do that in 119. Uh, we were really, really mindful like of the time of the year. But um, definitely, if you're one of those people, uh, you should definitely go and give comments on that um, that issue we linked, the discussion issue. Yeah, I, I would say I'm a developer, so I don't necessarily have the same pain points. But if you have an opinion, then I think like you have to share it with the community. So I would definitely follow the link that's in the slides to kind of make your voice heard. And you know, if you feel like there's something that's not being considered in the decision making, then really like articulate your concerns so that people can can discuss them. Uh, I see another question at the bottom here. Uh, we can answer real quick. Um, is Istio planned to be part of Kubernetes uh, in 1.22? Um, the answer to that is no. Kuber you know, Kubernetes and Istio are separate projects. Uh, their life cycle is separate. Uh, Istio is something you can install onto Kubernetes, but they are not intrinsically tied together. I mean, Istio runs on Kubernetes, but um, you can run Kubernetes without Istio. So I don't think that would be planned to be part of 122. Um, you, you would have to, you know, confirm that with SIG network, but I uh, really don't think that would be part of the 122 planning. Uh, question. Um, I'm having, I have kubectl installed in third-party machine and I'm accessing its Kubernetes cluster with kubeconfig. Is there any provision to make a check whether this third-party machine is legit or not? Um, just kind of rephrase that a little bit. Is there a way to verify that when you're using kubectl uh, to access a cluster that it's the right place? Is that the, 
Do you think that's a good summarization of the question, Kirsten? I think so. Um, yep. Maybe if it's not, yes. <laughs> we got confirmation. <laughs> yeah. So for that one, um, certificates, I think, are the are the answer. You know, you when you're connecting to these things, uh, when you look at your cube config, inside of that is a certificate authority and uh, or, or certificate data. And I think the the important one there is that at some point you have to have that kind of trust relationship with with those. Um, if you're using self signed certs, you you lose a little bit of that. Um, assurance, uh, but in like you know production use cases, uh, you can you can control what you know what servers the API server is providing and whether the whether the uh, the client trusts that or not. All right, any other questions? That looks like it. Anybody else have one they want to pop into the question box? I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, showing up. We weren't sure if anybody would show up to our webinar, so <laughs> I appreciate the support. <laughs> oh, so there's another question. Is there already a timeline for cloud providers adoption of 120? Um, so again, uh, that's a super good question. Uh, having worked with a cloud provider before, um, it's difficult, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into consuming these things. Um, you know, as a cluster operator now, you know, not as part of a cloud provider, you know, we have a lot of work that goes into making sure that we can, can ship that. They have the same amount of work, probably more so, because they have to make sure that it works across all of their, you know, all of their infrastructure, make sure that it fits into their existing tooling. Um, so we don't coordinate with them to say, hey, we're going to launch 120. When are you going to have you know, AKS 120 or GKE 120? Uh, if you look at the cloud providers now, um, they do lag behind. So I would expect um, you know, down the road, you'll see like early access to it. Um, but uh, you know, no, no firm guarantee of timelines between when the release happens and when uh, the cloud providers move to it. What are some of the few container image scanning open source solutions? Also, the same goes for uh, real-time container scanning. Um, there are different options for that. Uh, we, inside of my team, um, use a not open source tool for a lot of container scanning. Um, but I've also used Trivi in the past, which is a tool from uh, Aquasec. Um, can't make any like firm recommendations either way, though. All right. Well, we have about two minutes left. Is there anything you want to wrap up or conclude with? I just want to say thank you again to all the contributors that made 120 successful. Um, everybody that worked on a cap, everybody that worked on uh, tracking down test flakes uh, towards the end of the release. Um, just like a fun, quick story. You know, we we had uh, I think API priority and fairness um, had mm -hmm. a exception to the code freeze date and we were super nervous that it was because it's very impactful like every request basically goes through APF um, and we got to the end and it looked like it was good and then we started getting test flakes over the weekend and maybe more than test flakes so Monday came and we were two days away from the release like is this a problem or not what do we do <laughs> and uh, you know it, it was it was a lot of effort by a lot of people to get get over that line and make sure we were comfortable doing the release when we did it yeah uh, but so it ended in a high five, everybody. so that yeah. was nice. <laughs> and I still do thank Libby, actually, because yeah. I didn't know what to expect for this platform, and it's been very easy, very seamless. So oh, good. I hope I'm I don't fix it, but well, yeah, we aim great. To <laughs> well, thank you all for helping us test it out and kick off 2021. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone else for joining and Jeremy and Kirsten for a great presentation. Um, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up and these slides will be online later today. So take a look and the recording will also be up. So you'll be able to rewatch or watch if you weren't able to join us right now live. So thanks again, everyone for joining and we'll see you soon at another thank webinar. You. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.